One of the things uh, that we don't realize in our community is how many people we have in the media profession. And in fact, our good friend Sri Srinivasan, who you've met many times, uh, I think started an association, right, Aziz? Uh, South Asian Journalists Association. And it's grown and grown and grown. And we have uh, personalities in every form of media. And today we're proud to have someone from NPR. Uh, so we have Arthi Sahani. Arthi's a good friend and a fellow resident of the Bay Area. And uh, she covers all the big technology companies. So I'm sure you've heard on Morning Edition and many of the others uh, her great stories. But she had a calling a, a year or two ago when she said, I'm going to be actually writing a book about growing up in the U.S. And it's called American Dreams, American Nightmares. Here we are. And so I think uh, we want, Arthi was in town and we said, let's get her here to hear her perspective on uh, what her family did and also to take some questions with all of you. Arthi? Thanks so much. And you can get this, by the way, I can plug it. You can get this on Amazon. You can get it everywhere, yes. <laughs> I'll actually hold on to it for sure, a reason. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here, everyone. My name is Arthi Shahani. Uh, if you've heard my voice before, chances are I'm talking to you through your radio or your smart speakers in the morning about big tech. Um, and I am now an author, first time author. Here we are, American Dreams, American Nightmares, which is the story of my immigrant family. Um, it is very easy to live life on autopilot. Uh, you all know what I mean. And in 2016, two things happened for me around the time of the elections. My father had passed away a year prior. And I didn't realize it, but I was grieving that loss quite a lot, having memories of him, um, feeling that he was one of those people who was the backbone of our family, the backbone of American society, but criminalized, demonized in a lot of ways through current politics. Um, but I had memories of him. And then there were the elections. And what I saw happening in my country is that we have political leaders, not just one, but quite a few, political leaders who like to tell a story about who my family is. And that story does not match reality. And so I decided that as a storyteller, a journalist with a megaphone, it is important for me to tell the most important story I can at this juncture and I realized it was not a story about the, the companies I cover, but it's about my family and my upbringing, OK? Um, if you listen, uh, it's kind of funny. Yesterday morning, um, the, the NPR community heard me for the first, I don't know, maybe the last, but certainly the first time in my life, I actually uh, broke down crying on air talking about my book. Um, and what I want to share with you is sort of a few remarks really geared toward what this community is doing here in terms of bringing out the best in people to serve more and more is, I want to point out that people like me, there's one way to talk about my story. She's self-made. She came from a working class community. I was undocumented as a child. We got papers. We were pretty much always without money. I was a scholarship kid. I went to the best schools, an elite prep school in Manhattan that now costs a Tesla a year to go to. I went to the University of Chicago, to Harvard. I'm an NPR, an NPR correspondent. That model minority, right? Self-made. And the reality is there's no such thing as self-made, right? So in this book, what I track is how did I actually get to this place? It's a coming of age story. And I look at, first of all, the sacrifice of my parents. My father is a man who spoke six languages and could calculate very large numbers in his head, but he was fated to be a lifelong migrant from partition onward, leaving Karachi, going to India, from there to Beirut as a migrant worker, from there to other parts of the world before landing in Morocco, ha meeting my mom, having us, coming over to Queens. Every step along the way was a reset. He was, you know, irrelevant in the context of whatever new society he stepped into. I can't imagine this is an unfamiliar story to you. I see the nodding. My mom as well. What strikes me about my mom is she had to 
hustle, raising three children while undocumented, working as a seamstress uh, to, to help pay the bills, and starting a babysitting service. Now, I mentioned their story. These are my parents, right? So of course they're going to be there for me. But what I recall distinctly about growing up is we were poor. We did not know where the money was going to come from. And I lived in a building where everyone basically supported each other, OK? Well, this is what's fascinating to me also about America and the truth of the American identity, is you had Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, basically all the religions that you hear are at war and killing each other and gunning each other and shooting each other. And you land in a place where you're working class and you have a lot of cockroaches to kill and you have babies to feed and babysit. And suddenly you are each other's support network. I was raised by a network of women, many of whom were single mothers, who were helping my family to take care of me, to change my diapers, to clothe me, to give me ice baths when I had a fever because we didn't have any health care. I was raised by a network of mothers. That's a lot of people. That's giving. These are unsung heroes who in our everyday life actually make survival possible. And I point them out because we in this room, I get this sense, we have this sort of um, really treasured position of not just having to um, live our own lives, but seeking out how to inspire others to give, to see the importance of it. And what giving does, and I know this from my upbringing, is it creates connection. I grew up with love, so much love. I have never in my life felt that I did not have a community, which is antithetical, frankly, to how so many Americans feel, right? And it's because of the constant giving. It's funny, last night I did my book launch in New York City, uh, and one of my, my best girlfriends, who's a fa fantastic investigative journalist, I think one of the most important investigative journalists in the country, <laughs> she asked me what, what I called her, or what I said was her investigative question. She's like, so Arthi, you have told a story that is a deportation memoir. I haven't highlighted this point to you, but here we are, American Dreams, American Nightmares, focuses on the decade-long deportation case the government launched against my father and my efforts to keep him here. Um, but the other thing it is, I'm packing a lot in five minutes. Uh, the other thing it is, is it's a father-daughter story. As I mentioned to you, I lost dad. And grieving is a very iterative, interesting process that I've learned a lot about. And this book was my eulogy for him. So my girlfriend, the investigative reporter, asked me, so you've written about deportation. You've written about fathers and daughters. What is love? Has writing the book taught you what is love? It has. What I realized as I was going through the memories of my father and my whole family and making the arc of our life in this country is something that I can invite you into so you can witness what a three-dimensional immigrant family looks like as opposed to the headline that we see. What I realized in the process of those reflections is that love is when you turn towards someone when they are in need. It's not more complicated than that, right? Good times are so easy to share. They are really easy to share. And when someone is in pain, you can decide to look at them and step in and help, not afraid for your own survival, not afraid that somehow giving is going to reduce you, but knowing actually that we have an interconnection, trusting that and leaping into that or, or leaning into that. And it was really clear to me, you know, my father, I'll end with this comment before taking questions. It's funny what I was doing in this book because on one level, I feel that our country is going through a really horrible moment where the very lifeblood of this country, which is newcomers, which every generation refuels what America is, has been demonized and turned into something that is a liability. It's actually antithetical. There's sort of a, a perverseness going on among political leadership. And I wanted a memoir that would make that point. But more importantly, I just wanted to honor my father. OK, that's really what's happening over here. And something I realized in the course of writing my family story, which is full of tragedy, it is. There was a lot of pain in my growing up. Something I realized is my father is somebody who, when I was a child, was a stranger. You might have a dad like that. You might be a dad like that. Dad was the guy who was always working and then came home, this was before smartphones, smoke a cigarette. Didn't really know him. 
as I got older, he would sometimes be the guy who's like, why is that shirt so tight? Why is that skirt so short? Kind of adversarial. And over time, particularly as the US legal system, I don't call it the justice system for a reason, particularly as the US legal system came and attacked my father, and I saw him being villainized in ways that were not fair, and I leaned into it and actually became, you know, campaigning for him to stay here. Over the course of that fight, we somehow became best friends. And by the time his life ended, I can safely say, to the extent one can know their parent, and to the extent a daughter can be seen by her dad, we had that. And that happened through a process of leaning into each other. And really, I can't emphasize enough, um, you know, <laughs> when you give, <laughs> it is an opportunity to receive. Right? So thank you. Inspirational, emotional story. A couple of questions for RP. Anyone? Okay. Congratulations. I think uh, I met you at one of those uh, uh, the, the security events. I don't know. I remember. Oh, okay. You're from my tech life. Okay. <laughs> so, you're sitting next to me, curious about the security stuff. So, I think that was not more than four years ago. Uh -huh. uh, or maybe. So, congratulations and, of course, inspirational story. Thank you so much. Thank you. One more? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Fantastic. Really, I'm so inspired, Arti. Thank you for sharing it. Thank How you. easy or difficult was it to write about uh, your life story? Um, we Indians tend to be very private about uh, Hi, <laughs> our yeah. relationships and um, to talk about things like that. How easy or how difficult was it? And when you made that decision to do it, were you completely honest and transparent in the book? <laughs> so, you know, where you ended is where I want to begin, is it's not worth writing if you're not willing to be raw. Because it shows on the page. I mean, like, if you've ever picked up a memoir by someone running for president, <laughs> it's a terrible read for a reason, OK? Um, very few are good. And they're typically written well before that aspiration came in. Um, I thankfully feel I have um, the privilege, the platform to be myself. I have a family that is very supportive. Um, because my family went through so much in this country together, from being undocumented to getting our papers, to my dad, I, I, I can't get into the whole story, but my father being arrested, and a small case that was supposed to go away in eight months, spiraling into a 14-year legal battle because of changes in laws and some really horrific things. We have this sense, I believe, as a family that our experience is important for our country. And my family knows that their little girl, the baby, has the biggest mouth um, and can tell that story. And so what I let myself do in terms of the creative process was I told myself, Arthi, you are going to write whatever you want. The truth will come out. And the scenes that came there it really surprised me. The things that I was writing, the things that I remembered, the moment I would remember a certain remark that, for example, my father made. or you know, just It was really interesting. And what I told myself is, write it. Then give it to mom, my brother, and my sister. Dad has since passed, as I mentioned. Take their feedback, but they don't have veto power. Luckily, um, they, were, they, they felt they saw the truth on the page. Even, for example, throughout the book, my brother refers to me as stupid, because that's what he calls me in real life. Uh, he didn't mind that on the page he continues to call me stupid. Hey, stupid. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, you'd have to ask people with kids, yeah. <laughs> Arti, my name is Yogesh uh, Joshipura. Very nice Thank you very much for a very inspiring story. I look forward to reading your book. Please. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever thought of running for public office? <laughs> <laughs> because I can assure you, if you do, and you uh -huh. tell your story in your own way, yeah. I can assure you you'll get elected. Oh, wow. That is, uh, thank you for saying that. I, I will tell you what I feel my agenda is right now, um, which is not to run for office. My agenda, and I don't believe it's a political agenda. I'm a writer. I'm a creator. And I just believe that my, my mandate from above is to speak truth and to be in places that are relevant to speak it. Um, I believe that 
there is a huge disconnect in American culture right now between the fundamental openness of this culture. Travel, any corner of this country, not just the coastal elite, go wherever you want, open your Google Maps, search restaurants. How many ethnicities pop up? That is America. This is an absorbent place where people who would never have considered, mar people could, who could have been neighbors back home would not have married across their, you know, their ethnic group, their caste, whatever. Here those things fizzle and we merge. This is a, compare. it's all relative. Compared to other cultures, we live in an incredibly open, absorbent country. That is our culture. And then our laws are a totally different story because it's like, when people go into political office, when they seek that ambition, they somehow, over decades, this did not just start, over decades, keep talking about the immigrant as the other, the other, the other. We are in a society that is poisoned with not knowing ourselves. And it shows at the political level. And so currently, my only ambition is to try to help fix that. <laughs> Well, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for making it. Yeah. Thank you, Arthi, for sharing that with us. Uh, you know, we are all professionals and we all like to think of ourselves as doing fairly well in what we do, but this is a reminder, if ever one was needed, that what really moves us and connects us is our personal stories. So uh, thank you so much.